On a piano keyboard you will find 12 different notes, 12 notes in total. After B comes a new set of 12 notes. This and this are the same note but higher. So are this and this and so on. This set of 12 notes is called an octave. C, D, E, F, G, A and B are played using white keys and the black keys are sharps and flats. Between C and D is a C sharp or D flat and so on. This raises several questions. Octave is derived from a word that means 8. Why are there 12 notes? Why are there no black keys between E and F and between B and C? Why is there only a single key for both sharp and flat? Why does the concept exist? I will answer all of these questions. First let's establish some foundations for the music using mathematics and physics. Musical sounds are made by musical instruments. Each instrument makes a different sound. Sounds are pressure waves moving in air or in other substances called mediums or media. These pressure waves can be sparse and they can be tightly packed. Pitch or frequency is a description of how tightly those waves are packed. For example this is a 200 Hz sound and this is a 1000 Hz sound. Musical notes describe the pitch of the sound emitted by the instrument. Pitch tells how high the sound is. A low note has low pitch and a high note has high pitch. Tuning is a concept that describes how exactly notes are mapped to sound frequencies. By an international agreement, the note called A, or A4 to be specific, has been defined to be exactly 440 Hz. In other words, when I press this piano key, I get a 440 Hz sound. Today the vast majority of musical instruments are tuned according to a scheme called equal temperament. In equal temperament the interval between any two successive notes is always the twelfth root of two. Interval means the ratio of frequencies between two notes. In other words this interval is twelfth root of two or two raised to the one twelfth power. So is this and this and this and this. This means that if this note A4 is 440 Hz, then this note A sharp 4 is 440 times 2 to the 1 12th power, approximately 466 Hz, and this note B4 is 440 times 2 to the 2 12th power, approximately 494 Hz, and so on we can define the exact frequency for every single note on the keyboard. The interval that has the ratio of exactly 2 is called an octave. The octave has a ratio of exactly 2. This ratio of frequencies is found between any note and the next note by the same name. This means that the ratio between the frequencies of these two notes is 2, so is the ratio between these two, these two, these two, and so on. This system is however not how music originally worked. Let's start from scratch. Let's say we have a cello, and on the cello we make some note. This is any random note, for now it doesn't matter what it is. The sound is produced by vibrating string. The string can be vibrated by bowing or by plucking. For your and mine convenience I will do plucking. Now let's try to find new notes mathematically. If we halve the string length, this doubles the vibration frequency. In other words, this interval has a ratio to the sound is produced by vibrating string. The string can be vibrated by bowing or by plucking. For your and mine convenience I will do plucking. Now let's try to find new notes mathematically. If we halve the string length, this doubles the vibration frequency. In other words, this interval has ratio 2 by 1. The higher note has twice the frequency than the lower one. We could repeatedly halve the string length to get higher and higher octaves. In the diagram I did four octaves just for example. Now if we remove just one third of the note length, we get an interval of 3 by 2. Two thirds of the string are producing sound. How about the combination of these? First let's halve the string length and then add half of the remaining back. We get an interval of 4 by 3. Three quarters of the string are producing sound. The notes we have gotten so far are called perfect intervals. 
they were invented by Pythagoras, who lived in the 6th century BC. They are called perfect intervals because they only operate on single factors of 2 or 3. That is, this interval 3 by 2 and this interval 4 by 3. Remember, interval just means the difference between two tones. We can play these same intervals starting from any arbitrary frequency. For example, these two are also perfect intervals. Now if we take the one-third and add one-third of what we got, we get an interval of 9 by 8. We have played with prime numbers 2 and 3 so far. Now let's try with the next prime number, 5. Reduce the string length by one-fifth. We get an interval of 5 by 4. What can we do with this new tool? Let's take one of the perfect intervals from earlier, 4 by 3. And then let's try removing one-fifth of that. We get a new interval of 5 by 3. Next, the other perfect interval, 3 by 2. And then let's try removing one-fifth of that. We get a new interval, 15 by 8. These are the notes we have discovered so far. Hey, these are exactly the same notes as the white keys on the piano keyboard. These intervals each have a name. The first interval, which is from the first note to itself, is called perfect unison. Again, remember, interval just means the difference between two notes. The second one is a major second, then major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, and a perfect octave. Eight of them in total, all derived from simple mathematical ratios. The word octave comes from the Latin word octavus, which means eight. We have answered the first question. Octave is simply the eighth simple interval in a diatonic scale. But why stop there? Let's keep going. If we do 4 by 3 and then go forward by 4 by 3 more, which means shortening the string by one quarter and then shorter the remaining string by one quarter more, we get 16 by 9. Half forward and quarter backward and we get 8 by 5. Third forward and quarter backward and we get 6 by 5. Quarter forward and quarter backward and we get 16 by 15. Forward by quarter once, fifth twice, and then half backward, and we get 25 by 18. A third forward, then backward, and forward by fifth, and we get 45 by 32. A fifth forward twice, and half backwards, and we get 25 by 24. We could actually keep doing this forever, and continually discover new intervals. Western composers and musicians added new intervals very conservatively, only adding them when they wanted to create more complex harmonies. Let's see what we have got so far. We have the diatonic scale, as we established earlier. Let's give names to these particular notes. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and the next C. In between of these, we have an assorted list of new notes. Between C and D, we have two notes. C sharp and B flat. Between D and E we have just one. Between F and G we have again two notes, F sharp and G flat. Between G and A we have just one, and the same goes between A and B. Curiously, G flat appears to be lower than F sharp. All of these sharps and flats were relatively pure mathematical ratios, which only use prime factors of 2, 3 and 5. This is called five-limit tuning. It is possible to add even more prime numbers, but so far it has not been done. These are the ratios that have been settled with to make different combinations of pure harmonies work. We get a C-sharp if we want to play a minor third below E, but we get a D-flat if we want to play a major third below F. These are two distinct separate notes. This is why we have both sharps and flats. Note that the ratio between E and F and between B and C is 16 by 15. This is exactly as much as D flat. The span is too short to meaningfully fit a sharp or flat in between of these two, so that's why there are no sharps or flats in between of E and F, or in between of B and C. However, this method of tuning has the problem that it is tied to a particular starting note. Let's use C as a starting note. Let's say that C is 523 Hz, 
and then calculate the rest of these notes by using these ratios. We tune our instrument according to these frequencies. Now if we want to play the C major chord, which is the major third and the perfect fifth, we get a perfect nicely consonant chord sound that sounds pleasing. Now suppose that we play the E major chord using this same instrument. If the instrument was tuned with E as the starting note, this is the sound that we would get. However, if we play E, G sharp and B, which is supposed to be the E major, this is what we get instead. Here the difference, it's slightly off. The difference is not much, but to people who have perfect pitch, it sounds terrible. This difference is unacceptable when playing music at the level of classical concert symphonies. This is why classical symphonies always state the exact musical scale where they are supposed to be played. For example, Mozart's first symphony was called Symphony No. 1 in E flat major. If you wanted to play this symphony, or any other symphony, in some other musical scale, the entire orchestra would have to be retuned for the new key. This would be obviously hard to justify for instruments that take significant effort and time to tune, such as a grand piano. So in the 16th century, a Chinese mathematician called Zhu Saiyu proposed a compromise. A mathematical system where we have 12 tones, each at the constant ratio apart, so that octave still ends up having 2 by 1 as the ratio. That ratio is 2 raised to the 1 twelfth power, which is an irrational number, that is, it cannot be represented as a fraction. If we retune our intervals according to this ratio, we get this table of frequencies. Note that because we only have 12 semitones, we assign sharps and flats the same semitone index. Now, if we play the E major chord, it sounds like this. It's not perfect, but arguably it's less off than previously. If we play the C major chord, it sounds like this. Previously it was perfect, but now it too is slightly off tune. We can hear these differences more clearly if we play using pure sine waves. Here is the C major using pure ratios and equal temperament. And the E major likewise. And that's the beauty of the equal temperament tuning. While it is not perfect, it's fair. Everything is slightly off tune, but less by average than with the previous methods. And most people don't even notice any difference. And foremostly, it saves a lot of effort. You don't need to worry about which key you start from. Want to modulate your song one semitone up, five semitones up, three down? All of them work. Your composition will still be off tune, but is off tune always by the same amount, and you don't need to keep retuning your instrument for a different key. And the piano keyboard is simpler. The error margin in equal temperament is greater than the difference between sharps and flats, so sharps and flats are played using the exact same note. So we only get one black key between the white keys. This system is what nearly everyone uses today, at least in popular music. Now, I have never studied music formally in my life, except the little bits in comprehensive school. Nearly all of this is knowledge that I have accumulated in years from sources like Wikipedia, and it's very possible that to real experts out there, my video sounds like a slew of misinformation. I did make some shortcuts here and there to not get tangled in details, but I hope this at least answers some questions you may have had. See you again and have a very nice day.